just don't price your own work. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for an eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Costs 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the legal relationship between them. I'm Mark Stavion. and our guest today is John Chisholm, and here are three things you want to know about John before we start. He is, or at least was, a lawyer, but at least an, he's an Australian lawyer, not a U.S. lawyer. Uh, for 15 years, he's been law firms, used value-based pricing, and now subscription pricing, and Oh my God, I'm embarrassed to tell you this. He swims in the ocean every morning with his Speedo around his neck. Welcome, John. <laughs> I, I, I did that once for the winter solstice two days ago, but I do swim in almost every morning. Uh, so I live on the coast, so I'm very lucky to do that. Thanks, Mark. Great to join you. <laughs> it's going to be fun. So how did you get into pricing? How did a lawyer get into pricing? Oh, gee. Look, I, I did. I, I'll just go back when when I joined the law. I joined my father and grandfather's uh, law firm, and there was no. We never called pricing in those days, um, but I remember as a young article clerk, sort of equivalent to an apprentice. My father would take the article clerks. He was senior partner at the time, into a room and had a whole bunch of files, and he would um, he would literally maybe skim through the files, pick them up. Some people might say weigh them. Uh, and then he'd ring the client and say, oh, hi, Mr. Smith, it's Don Chisholm here. Uh, we finished you, you know, your matter. How do you think we went? You know, da, da, da. And if they said, you know, yep, terrific, did a great job, um, he would say, well, you know, we put our best and brightest on the case. Hope you're sitting down. The fee is <laughs> $100 or $500 or what have you. And, and then he would send out a bill. Um, occasionally, he would, you know, ring a client and say, "Hi, Mr. Smith, uh, Don Chisholm here. Uh, finish the matter. How, how do you think we went?" And sometimes the client would say, "Well, I'm still waiting for your son to return my phone call, or what have you." So, it, so, oh well, you know, in those circumstances, we'll, you know, the normal fee would be this, and we'd charge you that. Now, the the point with that, and my father passed away just on two years ago at 92 years of age. He was still a lawyer, practising lawyer. Uh, he never, ever sent out a bill to a client without ringing them first. Um, now, I, you know, it just he just called it common sense and almost to the day he died, he would say, what, people are paying you? to? <laughs> lawyers are paying you to tell them that? Um, so it wasn't what we made to value pricing, but he never, ever, you know, had a client surprise, and, that, and they'd always agreed with the fee. So the bill was not a surprise. Um, well, but I ran. Think about, hang on a second. If you think about that, that was actually quite brilliant because what he's doing is value based pricing from the perspective that said, How much value do I think you got out of this? And he's setting a price from, from after the fact as opposed to before the fact. I had a cost dispute. Um, or, or, you know, fee dispute. If there was any, you know, discussion, it was on the phone. But when he sent out the bill and he was assured that he was going to get paid and he just really thought, I mean, he would call it common courtesy, you know, common common sense. Um, so, but when I became, you know, partner in the law firm in the 1980s, not the 1880s, uh, as a young Turk sort of partner and because all the other law firms around the world, mainly from, the US were starting to build by time. Uh, we introduced timesheets. So I can remember the partners meeting and my father and the other senior partner saying, now, now why, why, why are we getting people to record time? And uh, we said, oh, it's just so we could find out the lazy people in the, in the firm, father, um, for no other reason. Well, so we're not going to build clients by time. No, no, no. Um, that was the second biggest lie I told my father, I think, in my life. But um, and within well, a few weeks, I'm we started. I'm confused because this is the first time I've ever heard this. As a law firm, you were actually doing, I'm going to call it timesheet free billing, 
which you could think of as almost value-based billing. And then you went into timesheets. Yep, absolutely. There was a scale of costs, which is some, it's almost sort of a Charles Dickens and Charles Dickens type um, scale of costs where you'd sit down and, you know, go through a file and how many folios and how many phone attendants. And there, and there was a regulated amount for each of those things. So there was, there was that. Or there was just, and at other times my father would agree, you know, it would be yeah, $100 for a will or whatever would agree up front. But when he hadn't agreed up front, he always, he agreed after the event, but before he sent out the bill. But it was completely time free. And most, every law firm till the late 1970s, 1980s here in Australia was time free. We didn't wow. record time. Mm. Wow. Mm. Okay, so then I'm sure you started billing by time, billing by the hour. We did, and uh, so that was, and that was a hard transition for many, particularly the older lawyers in the in the firm, to start recording time. Uh, and no one, as you know, no one. It's inaccurate anyway. But you know, we tried. We started billing, and but it was because the other, you know, larger firms were were doing it. And I'm not saying it wasn't. So the firms that, you know, two firms that I was partner, managing partner and CEO were terrific firms, spectacularly successful financially and otherwise. So, yeah. So that was, I think I became managing partner because quite frankly, no, I was shy at filling out timesheets. So um, I could make everyone else in the firm fill out timesheets <laughs> when I became managing partner and didn't have to do it myself. <laughs> But uh, we, so that's, yeah, that's how it started. Uh, so, okay, so so all my career as a practicing lawyer or CEO, or managing partner was built around what I call the old law business model, leveraging people by time, by hourly rate. Uh, we didn't have prices. We had the billable hour or we had fees or costs or what have you. And it was only when I left law at the end of 2004 and, drove around Australia with my wife for five months and then thought, what was I going to do next in my career? And I fell into consulting. And even that, I had no idea how I was going to bill or price my services. I certainly wasn't going to start recording time after all the years, not recording time as a CEO and managing partner. And I started doing some projects for you know some friends who were managing partners of other firms. And... Um, they said, how are you going to price your service? I, said, well, I don't know. And what I did, I know it sounds really naive and bizarre. My accountant didn't like it at the time. And I said, look, Mark, I'll just do this project for you. And, you know, you, you, you see what it's worth at the end of the day and pay me what you think it's worth. I, and literally I did that in my first two or three projects as a consultant and Actually, I was getting paid more than what I would have if pressed price my own services at. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Either they feel sorry for me or perhaps I was doing a you know, better job or providing more value than what I thought. And then from there, that, that triggered my interest in, um, I don't know if we Googled, probably Microsoft Explorer, Internet Explorer at the time, uh, looked up pricing. Fortuitously, at the end of 2005 or mid-2005, I went to a conference in Sydney, Australia, and there was a guy, an accountant, a guy called Paul O'Byrne, who sadly has passed away, and he was talking about value pricing. He was an accountant from Goss Oak in, in England, uh, north of London, and it was my aha moment. I, it was like, come to mama. He just talked about his small accounting practice, how they had ditch the not just the bill by hour but timesheets and I was just I'd never heard the concept um, uh, even pricing let alone value pricing mark so it's them Paul was a member of um, who you would know to Ron Baker's Verisage Institute um, and I just followed around Sydney for two days he was in Sydney asking all these stupid questions and what have you and I think to get rid of me he said look Next time you're in London, come and visit me. And within two months, I jumped on a plane, went to London, uh, spent two weeks with Paul. He introduced me to, you know, how they did pricing at the time. 
his clients and I was just I was just amazed and I thought gee if a you know pretty average lawyer like me could could get it this is going to revolutionize the legal profession and this you know this is a much better way of running our practice and practicing our craft so I brought Paul out to Australia and we worked with some clients and um, you know did presentations uh, to law firms back in 2006 2007 um, and guess what nothing happened they also that's like that's so. That's 15 years ago. So by now, all of Australia must be doing value-based pricing, right? All of the no. legal firms? <laughs> no. As our mutual pricing friend, Ron Baker, would say, it's hard to tell a room full of millionaires that their business model sucks. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I wish in 2022 I was not still talking about moving law firms or other professional firms too, but certainly law firms away from billing by time. But no, it's uh, very, uh, very ingrained, the whole profession, I'm afraid. There has been a lot of movement, but they've been mainly in smaller, um, innovative firms. But the large firms, despite what they say when you peel back the onion, um, their measurements, their rewards, their whole you know, internal system still work around time and it's hard to change and they're very yeah. successful at it. So let, let, let's talk about that for a second. And, and I want to use some analogies and, and you tell me what's going on in my mind, because I think lawyers, clients think the same way I do in some respects. So I had a bookkeeper and my bookkeeper was charging me $500 a month. And I felt like I was getting ripped off. And uh, she ended up firing me because I wasn't giving her enough money. But uh, another, I had to find another bookkeeper. She charged me by the hour. And I probably pay her on average 275 bucks a month. And so I was right. I was getting ripped off, maybe. Right? But, but the whole time I'm paying this flat rate, let's call it a value-based fee or a subscription fee, in my mind, it was, well, I don't know if I'm getting cheated or not. So what do you think lawyers' clients, are they thinking the same thing? Yeah, I think we did a great sell job as a profession. Moving to the billing by time didn't come from the clients out there. It was the you know, profession um, introduced it to clients. You know, I would say, therefore, we can you know, take it away from clients, but that's, an, that's another story. But, yeah, and I think we did a Good job. You 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 know you only pay for you know the work all the time we're spending on on something. So it's hard to change that mindset around. I think at least in the legal profession at the top end of town, which is where the large firms, the global law firms are. When you think of it, Mark, most of their clients uh, are lawyers themselves. And I know I get into trouble saying this, but lawyers buying and selling to each other is not a great recipe for innovation or change or taking risk and you know so they're in-house lawyers and they learned their trade um, they may have moved out of um, private law firms but into in-house roles but it's what they knew they knew the billable hour now they may complain about bill shock and you know the how high the rates are and whatever but it's it's the system they know so there's no there hasn't been at the big end of town a, a really a burning platform to 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 change anyway. Um, and the legal profession, unfortunately, it, it's changed to some degree now. But you know, we looked at the larger firms. You know, when I was running a mid-tier law firm, we'd look at some of the bigger firms and go, "Wow, we've got to do what they're doing." You know, and if if they change to billing by time or, or something, you know, it must be the right thing to to do. Um, and the in-house counsel are often not the true economic buyer. They, they, uh, so the most success, the most successful law firms that I've worked with around the world have probably been uh, ones where their clients are, you know, private individuals or or or. or um, SMEs, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, an economic buyer, um, and it makes sense. They would, most of them would prefer um, a, a fixed price for a fixed scope of work. Um, 
So, um, yeah, it, it just hasn't, it, it's slowly changing, very, very slowly changing. Um, but I think, you know, those that perceive they have the most to lose will be the last to change and that will be the big end of town world worldwide. So there's some fantastic, uh, really innovative, uh, small and mid-tier lawyers that are doing not just great pricing, but as you, as, as you know, once you both stop billing by time and you know, I think recording time, it just opens up a whole new world of creativity, not, not just for your pricing, but for how you solve, uh, how you deal, your relationship with your clients. But, you know, it's it's really hard to explain that even, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years to lawyers when they haven't experienced. You, you've almost got to, ex- <laughs> you know, experience before you see the you know the benefits so and a lot just won't won't jump yeah or won't take the risk so i want to put myself in the shoes of the buyer again and uh, and and give you a different example and have you talk to me about how you teach lawyers about this and and the issue is i went in to get my car fixed and uh, of course there's a sign that says 75 bucks an hour to, to work on your car and nobody knows what, what's wrong with my car. So it's going to be a while before they get it fixed. But when I go to check out, there was a sign on the on the cab counter that said I could get a new battery replaced for $149. Now that wasn't by the hour. That was, hey, I'm going to do this project. It's 149 bucks. Do you want this project or not? And so the difference between those two is the certainty of the amount of work that needs to be done. How do you teach lawyers if they're not certain or if they are certain of the work that needs done? Uh, Well, I think firstly, you have to have a value conversation. Billing by time, I think, and hopefully you'd agree with this, if I can, you know, if I've got my lawnmower man or a tradesman or what have you, you know, I can follow him around the house or follow him around the, the yard to see whether he's actually you know, doing work or not. So that's the, you know, the labour arbitrage. You can see that. I, I think with professionals where hopefully what um, the benefit of having a professional is, you know, their thinking time, their knowledge, their cerebral, what's in their head, that sort of stuff. And that's, that's hard. It's, it's not tangible. You can't, you can't tell what I'm really thinking, what I'm really, you know, you, you can, you could see whether I'm, drafting a will or send, sitting in court i you know i understand that but i think that's just that's just the basic stuff and and i try and educate professionals that really what they're selling is not that um you know not that tangible stuff that anyone can do anyone can do that it's not even the the, the drafting of the will it's thinking about you know what terms thinking about asking the right questions so you know we call it the value conversation and and that's that's hard to do I as a practicing lawyer never you know if a client came in you know we we're keen to do the work and we had this we called it taking instructions you know and and you did you didn't have to scope it because there was no incentive really as provided the client was prepared to pay me how long it you know, my hourly rate and how long it took me, you know, we would just, you know, do do things. But I, I think if you can sit down and they're not even legal questions you're asking. So I, I, I try and get the lawyers that I work with, my clients, to, to stop thinking like lawyers because often the solution is not a legal solution, Mark. It, 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 it really isn't. Um, um, or the objectives are not a, a a legal solution. It may be that you know what we're going to do has legal um, input, and that's the skills that you know the lawyers have that that someone else doesn't have. But um, it's yeah, it's turning the conversation on its head. It's asking the right questions, and and I think you know the the true indication of a, a really good professional is not so much the answers they give; it's the questions they they ask and. So I spend most of my time, I think, um, with lawyers trying to, A, get them to understand much better the value they're providing to their client or not providing and only going to do that 
by sitting down and having a, a conversation. And it, it really is a conversation um, with with their clients beforehand. Um, yeah, so but, I love I love the idea of value conversations. I write about them in my newest book. But to yep, me, th- this one is going to be interesting for you. And I'm going to go back to the bookkeeper story I told at the beginning that said I felt like I was getting cheated. Yeah. So now imagine that the first bookkeeper comes in and she says, uh, what problem are you trying to solve? Uh, what's that worth to you? And she realizes that she's going to charge me 500 bucks. Maybe she's going to charge me a thousand bucks. And I think, you know, I could find someone to do that less. How do, how do we handle that in a value conversation? Well, I think you can give options to clients. And I know you're a you know, big believer in options. And most of the, you know, I, I, I could maybe do something for 270 bucks instead of 500 bucks, but it won't be the same benefits that um, you'll get if you're paying me, you know, $500. Also, and I give it, and many of my client law firms do it, they give a service or a price guarantee. Mark, if you don't think you've got value out of the five hundred dollars, talk to me about it and see how that, you know, um, if we haven't, you know, what we agreed to do, and if you haven't got the value, let's, you know, let's have a discussion, and you know, maybe the price will be different. Um, I'm prepared to back myself because you know I believe you'll get five hundred dollars worth, but at the end of the day, value is subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder, and if you think you haven't got it. Tell me why. Hopefully, I'll learn from that, and we move on. But, but, I, and I think giving that service or price guarantee together with, you know, trying to work out some options, um, and this is not MBA stuff. And, but I, I just have a simple, you know, value or perceived value, um, whether it's in a law firm context or just everyday life context, is no more than. The, the benefits you get or perceived benefits you get over the price you pay. And, you know, value can be increased by decreasing the price, get better, you know, value. Um, The benefits stay the same. Or I can increase the benefits and maybe increase the price or the price stays the same and the value increases. And, And I work more with my client lawyers focusing on what additional benefits can you give to clients many of which don't cost anything to the law firm, but add value to the client. And, you know, the, the price just fo- just follows. Um, a client has to make a profit out of using our services. And, and I think also if you can focus on increasing the client's profit, our profit will follow as a profession. Yeah, and I think it's the way pricing people should be thinking all the time. How do we increase the profit of our clients? How do we increase the plot profit of our customers? John, we're running out of time. I still have two more things I need to do with you. First one is the typical last question. What's the one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Just, I think, Vinny, just don't price your own work. And I know that's easy to say, and I work with sole practitioners who, well, that you know, who do I go and, and talk to? Sometimes, you know, I act as a pricing or value counsel for them. But, you know, I work with some firms where they have their, their personal assistant or their secretary or, shock horror, their spouse who they talk to before they go and price any work. And I think um, if if you talk to someone about, Price and and not only price comes up, but you know, is is a, is a scope right? Can you can you offer options? I think it invariably increases the price. Plus, it gives um, the professional confidence to much more confidence to go in and having a discussion with clients. So, if you did nothing else, um, just you know, don't price your own work. I actually love that. And one of my favorite things to do is when my pricing friends call me to ask for pricing advice. I just think that is so much fun um, for exactly that reason. So, John, okay, one more thing. And you actually haven't heard me do this yet in the podcast because we haven't released any of them where we've done this before. But we're going to play a little game. It is called Pricing Table Topics. If you've ever been to Toastmasters, 
or heard of Toastmasters, Table Topics is this exercise they do where uh, we ask you a question and you have to speak on it for one to two minutes. That's your goal. And I've made a nice new deck of cards. They're the impact pricing cards. And each one of these cards has a saying on it. I'm going to read to you the saying, and you get to talk for one to two minutes. And all I can say is good luck. (laughs) I don't think I signed up for this. All right, let's go. (laughs) Let's try and see what happens. You know, happens to be the three of hearts. Sunk costs don't matter to pricing or any business decision. One to two minutes. Yep. From a client's perspective, it doesn't. I think the the, uh, cost should follow the price. Most law firms, at least, you know, already have um, sunk costs. And, of course, you've got to price more than what the the cost is. But... um, you know, working out profitability of client or profitability of matter, I've moved so far away from, from that. Um, you look at the profitability of the lifetime of your, you know, um, customer or how long your customer is. Um, we used to pretend in law firm context that we could, you know, make money out of every six minutes. It's absolute BS. And clients don't care about our costs. They really don't. I don't care about costs when I'm, you know, talking to some other other provider, so um, we just got to get over that. Costs are there. We we know what the cost is of running, you know, a law firm to the nth degree. Um, law firms are fantastic at that. They just don't know the price to or the value to their customer. All right, you made it to a full minute. Nice job, John. And uh, and overall, I love the answers. So excellent. What? How did that feel? Was that painful? No, it was it was good. Um, it makes you makes you think on the spot. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and, I, and I love, that's it. The whole love your work. That that's yeah. that's great, Mark. Introducing that, John. Thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Um, you can contact me, John at chisconsult.com or www.chisconsult.com is my website and. Um, Yep, happy pricing. But I have to say, um, pricing, at least in the law firm context, moving away from the billable hour and and even time recording, it is it is just a thin edge of the wedge. Once you do that, the you know it's just like taking off the straight jacket. And I've seen it with you know, so many good lawyers. I, I think, even though it may be for short term profitability, Mark, um, there's just you know so many good lawyers that just do underestimate the value that they're providing to their clients. And that's their fault, not their clients' fault. Yeah. And and for a law firm to move from our to value-based pricing, they actually have to think about the value to the customer. Wow. Go figure. Right. Yeah. Interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But we'll get there one day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Episode 185 is all done. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And if you like the podcast, your pricing colleagues probably will too. So please shout it, share it, tell everyone. And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.